morning, everybody. I have to wait for the stragglers today. Okay. Love the music. <laughs> well, we rely up. on when it comes to Tippy. Tippy just manages to find everything that matches with everything. Love so uh, thank Tippy. you again, Tippy. And thank you to Neats. Anita always for managing to get the, the recording. And I'm going to have to start posting where the YouTube is and then everybody can find whatever it is that they want. In fact, if Tippy's there, she can actually put that up for us now. Um, and I, ah, oh, there we go. Mora Rachel, um, that beautiful view and beautiful picture. And... Uh, We are ready to begin. And the sun's shining here beautifully in London too. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Rabbits and Silva. Hope you are very well and healthy in the Holy Land. And I'll just say, I am waiting to put a price on the fly before I send it out. But um, um, <clears throat> the, the date, Emir Sashem, is the 23rd of January. And I also just wanted to wish Dalia Chai Marochem, and we should learn today, Le'ilu Nishmas, Sipora Bas Binyamin. She just got up from Shiva yesterday. <clears throat> and the one thing that Dalia has been inspired um, through is the Tehillim and her connection with her mom. And uh, she's actually taken on to Helim in a special way. So the Ezra Sashem, it should have its place in the Aliyah, the Neshama of her beautiful, beautiful, beautiful person that, that she was in this world and continues to be in the next. And also the share today was sponsored by somebody who didn't want her name out there. She just wanted to say thank you, Takarish Baruch Hu, um, because her son-in-law had... Uh, Thank God, a minor accident, but it was a bit of a shock to everybody. And she wanted to make sure that she put it to something that would be real. So she called me and she said, what can I sponsor? What can I sponsor? I said, Thursday morning. And uh, tonight I have the 31st year outside of my father, Avram ben Shmola Kohen. And we should, Be'ezat uh, Hashem, it should be for Nalia Nashama. Okay. Amen, 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 amen for all the Nashamas and all the refuas, and all the Yeshuot, the Nechamot. Amen. You know, it's so easy for us to say like, you know, Lili Neshama, and we make it like it's nothing, but you realize in Shamayim they're celebrating. Whoever is now coming and having an Ili Neshama, having our, a, a section in our in our shir, they're like cheering and happy. So, call a kavo to the people who sponsored. Call a kavo to the women who come to the shir, because without people who come, we're not gonna, we're not, we don't have that. Call a kavo to everybody, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to learn with you and to start about Hanukkah. So somebody did have a question about a name, and I'll say that at the end of the, the Ezra Hashem. You'll remind me five minutes towards the end. We'll talk about the questions that you had on names. But let's really get into Hanukkah. I'm sure that you have, I don't know if you have, I don't know, you have in England the uh, Sufkaniot, you don't have like what we have here. Here we have already, everybody is celebrating Hanukkah. The stores are full of menorahs and candles and uh, you know, every paraphernalia that you might need for Hanukkah. You know that, Baruch Hashem, here we, every yes, if we have, we all celebrate together. I remember in America, when I was in America, when I lived in America, so this time of the year, they would be, uh, you know, turkeys everywhere because in America they celebrate Thanksgiving at the end of November. And then right away, as soon as the turkeys were over, they would have their lice and their, all their stuff for their main 25th of December holiday. 
And I, you know, it was hard to walk into stores because you, you know, as a kid, I learned all of the, all of the songs because in the, uh, in the department stores, that's what you heard. You heard the songs and you heard, you know, they're basically trying to be like uh, cheerful and nice to each other, all in the spirit of the holiday, all that. So, and for everybody here, now I'm here. And we don't have any of that. We have no idea what's happening here in terms of the non-Jewish holidays. Ad they come to the point where we have, we sell uh, Xmas decorations to put into the sukkah because the Israelis don't know and they don't care, you know, so, and China doesn't care. China's very happy that Israel buys uh, Xmas decorations in August to put up in September for us to have in the sukkah. So Baruch Hashem, the, the, um, we're filled already with Hanukkah. And one of the advantages of Hanukkah, and that's why it's so important to prepare for Hanukkah, one of the main advantages is, if you think about all the other Yom Tovim, every other holiday has major preparation. Meaning, for all the holidays, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, there's a lot of cooking we have to do before Yom Tov. And Shavuos, you know, we have to get all the cheesecakes ready. And Pesach, we have to do all the pre-Pesach stuff. I don't need to tell you about that. And Sukkot, we have to do all, do all the pre-Sukkot stuff, right? And Purim, even Purim, we have to do the Shalach Manos and that, that mindset. Um, Hanukkah is the only answer that we have to do no preparation, minor preparation. You take down the menorah, you wash it up a little bit. If you have a silver one, you polish it up a little bit, make sure that you have the candles. And even if you don't have, like even if you've messed up in the first day you don't have, so you can light any oil that you have. And uh, the next day, when the end of is, uh, you know, ready in Hanukkah, you can already go and buy whatever you need to buy. So that's why it's important. Uh, Sippy, you want to you wanna use everybody, sweetie? Thank you. Or Joanne, you can do that. Um, so that's why it's so important to mentally prepare for Hanukkah. And I, and I, wanna, um, I want to um, remind everyone that Hanukkah is the most famous of all the Jewish holidays. Hanukkah, right? They, they don't even say, couldn't, they can't even say, it's the most famous. And how do we know it's the most famous? Because the Christian world made their major holiday the 25th of December to parallel the 25th of Kislev. It's not an accident that it happened like that. Their major holiday, uh, it, they wanted to, they made it to try to cancel out or to at least um, compete with Hanukkah. It's a very, very important holiday, even though it's the easiest to celebrate. What's the big deal? How do you celebrate Hanukkah? Lamaisa. What do we do? We, we light a candle every night. Minimum of you know, the minimum of celebrating of Hanukkah to be, to fulfill the mitzvah is very, very simple. Okay, so um, Hanukkah is the biggest battle that the Jewish people have had in current times, and we are still fighting that battle. It's the battle of assimilation. It's the battle of how much am I going to be Jewish how much am I going to show my Jewish my Jewishness? How much am I going to feel pride in my Jewishness? That's our biggest um, our biggest uh, uh, problem now in, in exile, the end of the exile. And how much of how many of us are uh, sadly lost, intermarried? Ah, uh, you know there are certain there are some uh, some uh, statistics and numbers, Rabbi Kessin quotes this a lot, that 11 million Jews are lost, either to assimilation, to ignorance, to intermarriage. It's our biggest uh, fight now. We're not enslaved in Mitzrayim, and we, uh, you know, so Pesach is a great holiday, but we're not fighting that battle so much in, a, in an overt way. You might, you might say, okay, Mitzrayim represents all of our Yetzirah. There's a lot of darshan on that. But Lamaisa, the actual, we're not in Mitzrayim. We're not slaves. And we're not in the desert anymore with the sukkah, with the clouds around us. And we're not sitting by Har Sinai anymore. We have those halays. They're already built into us. But Hanukkah, we're still by, fighting that battle. 
And even though Purim was the, and, and even though Purim is also such a holiday, it's a Durabanan holiday, but on Purim, I think that, you know, we're still doing the Purim. We're still fighting the Purim battle, but really more we're fighting the Hanukkah battle. Why? Because we all remember that, and by the way, Hanukkah was the final holiday that was ever, um, that was given to us. And then afterwards, we don't have any more mandated holidays. Hanukkah is the final one. So it has to schlep us into the whole exile. And what was Hanukkah? We are all chutznikim originally. We don't have any Meisharam ladies here. So what is Hanukkah? Hanukkah is a battle of culture. And it's really hard to know. It's a very thin line to know what is indeed Jewish. And when does Jewish culture sort of like segue into non-Jewish culture or what, or vice versa, when does non-Jewish culture seep into and penetrate Jewish culture? And is it bad if non-Jewish culture, like, is it bad to have sushi at the, from, at the Friday night meal for your fish course? The first time I saw that, I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was by one of my cousins actually in America. And, um, and this is before I ate healthy, so I ate whatever. And uh, the fish course, they came out with sushi. And of course somebody, and it was also like a little platter of the filter fish for all of those like really old fashioned people who want real fish. And I never saying to my cousin, like, what's sushi? Like I, I was not, an, I'm not a foodie. And I didn't know that sushi is made up of raw fish at the beginning. In other words, when sushi first came out in America in the kosher world, when was that, 25 years ago? Um, I didn't know what sushi was. I remember the first time my students took me to a sushi place on Central Avenue. Uh, my precious Ahab is here, so she knows. I don't know if that place is still there. There was one place, uh, one kosher sushi place in Central Avenue. Maybe it wasn't even sushi. Maybe it was that chosen restaurant, and they had sushi there. I didn't know what sushi was. And a bunch of my students said, okay, it would take me to sushi. I said, okay. And we went, and I was like, I'm not eating that. That's raw fish. That's gross. Anyway, is that bad that some people, the you know, holiest of holiest people, they have sushi in their fish course. So how much is it kosher for the secular culture to come into our culture? And how much are we going to be super stubborn and only have potato kugel, luxion kugel, chicken soup, and right? I remember my father used to rest in peace. I told you the story. My father, when I wanted to make once a broccoli kugel when I was a teenager and I was into like diets and healthy and uh, in those days diets to lose weight, not diets to be a healthy person. Just to, and I learned about broccoli that like there's zero calories in broccoli. So instead of potato kugel, which is 10,000 calories with tons of oil, we're going to make broccoli kugel. My father said, you can't make broccoli kugel on Shabbos. It's like trace. He couldn't, he couldn't, he didn't, he wouldn't let. <laughs> Eventually, you know, I said, okay, daddy, whatever. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll compromise. But he says, you don't do that. That's not Jewish. That's not Shabbistic. So how much are we allowed to do that? You know, and, and everybody, there's no, there's no hard and fast law. There's no hard and fast rule about how cultures, of course, there's a, if there's a, a, if there's halachic, uh, if there's a halachic problem, so of course we're not going to do it. But if it's a cultural kind of a thing, so we're still dancing that dance and trying to figure out what is appropriate, what's not. And that's because the Pasuk in the Torah tells us what was the, who was the source of, of culture? That was Yefet, of, of the three sons of the Noah, Shem, Ham, and Yefet. Yefet was the one, the source, the source of culture. Says in Chumash, in Bracious, the ninth paragraph, the 27th Pasuk, it says, Yefet, Lakim, Yefet. Vuhu Yishkon, Ba'ole Shem, Yefet which is, again, the source of yofi, yofi, beauty, and beauty represents all things of culture, music, art, decoration, foodies, uh, 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 theater, the whole bit. Yes, it, yes, it will expand as long and is allowed to expand and is encouraged to expand as long as it stays within the boundaries of shame, within the borders of morality, because what is shame? Shame is us. And so yes, a culture, and everything that the Greeks represented is fine, as long as it's bordered and defined by us, by shame, by the Jewish people. And so now there's a big machlokos going on. I don't, I don't, uh, 
I didn't read this in the magazine, but there's a big machlokas going on. And one of the schools I teach in, one of the, the heads of the school wrote this big article about, I don't know what's going on about uh, Bain Hasmanim, the boys in Bain Hasmanim, are they allowed to go do sports? Are they not allowed to go do sports? I don't know exactly what the machlokas is, like what the source of that is. But, you know, here in Israel, depending on which yeshiva you go to, you either, yes, play with the ball during recess or you do not play with the ball during recess. In Meishar, they still do not play with the ball during recess. They play with other things. And here in Harnof, you play with, you know, there's every yeshiva has a basketball court in the back to get the, let the guys, you know, uh, get out a little bit of their energy. So as long as it's within borders, then yes, it is fine. And that's the, that's, the, that's the war that we're fighting right now. Same thing with how we dress. Oh, well, I'm not going to get into that, but we all know. There's so many different levels of how a, person, a woman, a Jewish woman, could be within halacha and yet be dressing in different ways. So everybody has to make that, that's their, that's their personal war, is do I feel modest in this outfit or do I feel gorgeous in this outfit? And do I feel beautiful or do I feel gorgeous? Gorgeous like in the word gorge. To gorge is like to stuff yourself. Do I want to be like a knockout and make people faint? Or do I want to be beautiful? Beautiful is beautiful. But gorgeousness and, you know, attention seeking. Okay, so every woman has a different machshava and a different level and different understanding. You know, some women go in capes and they cover themselves completely. We don't do that. They're doing that in there. That's their mind. But that's the battle of Hanukkah. That's why Hanukkah is the most famous um, holiday among the Jewish people, even though everyone knows Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the world knows that, but the world knows eight days of Hanukkah and the Maccabees and all of that stuff. And again, the Christians wanted to usurp Hanukkah, and that's why they made their holiday on the 25th of December to try to at least balance, because in the beginning Christianity was just a bunch of mixed up people and a bunch of, uh, and also a bunch of pagans, and they had to take an energy level that was going to energize them. So they took, they took the 25th of the month of Kislev, but they translated it into December. Okay, so now, so Hanukkah is very important, number one. Number two, Hanukkah is a fabulous holiday for all the Jews. I'll tell you why. Everyone here knows, we all know, because we all keep halacha. We all know that Hanukkah is a derabanan. It's a rabbinically ordered, ordained, ordained holiday. No, we're in Chumash, just to talk about Hanukkah. There are all kinds of hints to Hanukkah. Chav hey, right? Chashmona, right? A lot of different hints to Hanukkah in the Chumash that, right, that Hanukkah would eventually be. But there's no, Hanukkah happened in, a, right? It happened a thousand years ago. Torah was given 3,300 years ago. So it's, and it's, a, and it's written, the only time we know about Hanukkah, where we learn about Hanukkah? From the Gemara Shabbos. The Gemara Shabbos has like two pages, page 22, I think 21, um, talking about Hanukkah. I think those are the pages. So Hanukkah is, an, but, uh, and yet, Hanukkah is celebrated by Jews worldwide. Jews who have no affiliation celebrate Hanukkah. Every single Jew in Israel has, celebrates Hanukkah, even if only culturally by eating donuts. I told you that one time I was in a taxi uh, Hanukkah time, and maybe it was in Hanukkah. This was years ago. And uh, the taxis, I, so I haven't been in a taxi in a while, um, but so I forgot already. I used to go in taxis a lot because I had in two different, I had uh, um, classes in two different parts of the city in Yerushalayim, and I had to go from one to the other. So I, the only way I could go was in the taxi. So um, to get there. So it was in this taxi, and the, and the dispatcher gets on the rum call. The rum call is the, how do you say rum call in English? Like the, the, uh, how, no, how do you say it? Like the the, loudspeaker. The loudspeaker, the, what, what'd you say, Miriam? Okay. Yeah, this, the, the dispatcher. Yeah, the dispatcher gets on, on the loudspeaker. Gets on the loudspeaker. Yeah, he gets on the thing, the radio that's in all the different uh, taxis. CB radios. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> called, you know, they, the dispatcher gets on and he's in Hebrew. He's, he's making a bit, he says, everybody listen, pay attention, pay attention. Now, usually when taxis do that, it's because there's a, um, there's some kind of a incident and the dispatcher wants to make sure that the taxis don't go and get stuck in that traffic jam. So let's say, for example, if there's a traffic jam in one part of the city, 
So the dispatcher will get on and say, attention, attention, all cars. And then, you know, don't go near the Kinsel here because it's a demonstration. So you're going to get stuck in traffic and that's going to be a mess. So the dispatcher says, attention, attention, all cars. And I'm listening to see what's it going to be. And he says, okay, who's bringing the donuts today? We have to do the donuts already. We have to get the Sustanio schedule. I want to have everyone to... It seems that in this dispatcher, I was taking the hard note for a taxi thing, in the office, they have to have air of Avokavis Horayim. They have to have morning, noon, and night, a, diff a different uh, thing uh, of, of donuts. So everybody should come in, all, the, all the, the taxi drivers should come in, they should have in the office donuts. So he was so, he was totally serious. He said, okay, you know, Shlaimi, you're going to bring in Monday morning at lunch, and Aaron, you'll bring Monday afternoon, and Chaim, you'll bring Monday night. Like, my much tied up the whole uh, loudspeaker system just to do this donuts thing. I was laughing, but that's how Israelis celebrate Hanukkah. Like matzah is Pesach and donuts is... So why am I telling you that? Of course, that's not how you celebrate. All the, the Israelis do light menorahs, and we know that, you know, in the municipalities, there's menorahs, and Chabad has all of their menorahs all over the country. But one of my the point is that all Jews celebrate Hanukkah, which is a rabbinical holiday, which is a, a major limud zchus. It's a major merit for Jews who don't have nebuch, don't have Jewish education, are not shomer mitzvahs yet, and yet Hanukkah, which is mamish rabbinic, they even if they will deny rabbinic law, you know, you have uh, some Jews who say they don't. It, they, they don't keep Talmudic law, they don't keep rabbinic law, right? Stuff like that. They have like all these crazy things in their head that they, but Hanukkah they keep, which is a testimony to the soul of the Jewish pe people. The soul of the Jew keeps Torah, even rabbinical Torah, even Torah Shabbat al -Pet, even the oral Torah, the soul of the Jewish people keeps. And that's a big schluss for the Jewish people. And that's why I say, if your grandchildren like presents, give them presents. If they like latkes, give them latkes. If they like donuts, give them donuts, give them money. Anything because the perpetuation of Hanukkah, it, what your kavan, your intention is, oh my gosh, Marcel, that's such a British way to drink tea. What about like a big fat cup, right? Marcel and I hung out together. I can't wait to hang out with, yeah, like what Joanne has. Yeah, you're so British. I can't wait to hang out with you guys. Marcel came to Israel. We hung out, we met in Shepherdco, we hung out a little bit. So the session for all of you. Okay, oh, so now we understand why, um, why Hanukkah is such a miraculous holiday because it highlights the soul of the Jewish person, that even the soul of the Jewish person doesn't keep mitzvahs, but somehow is gravitating towards and, and remembers, remembers Hanukkah, remembers the idea that there is a Torah, a written Torah, an oral Torah, an explanation of Torah, rabbinical decrees that we consider Torah. The rabbinical decree we consider Torah. Anyway, big schus for us, for the Jewish people. And that's why, interestingly enough, in Hanukkah, you have the most... Now, for those of you who, who are not uh, gematria-oriented, this not, might not be so inspiring, but I like gematrias, I like numbers, I like letters. Uh, Hanukkah is the holiday that has in all the svarim, in all the svarim, all the Jewish books, commentaries, etc., has the most um, uh, gematria, numeric, numerology, letter playing, playing around with letters. Or well, as you'll see in a, in a few seconds, why is that? It's again because Hanukkah is a rabbinic holiday. And it's representing the idea that we are holding on to halacha, even though we're being drowned in Greek uh, culture, we're still holding on. By, our, by the skin of our teeth, we're holding on to halacha. And you know what, ladies? Maybe you're getting even more religious in your old age. What do I mean by that? When we were younger, listen, I come from a from family of Baruch Hashem, but there were certain halachas that my parents forgot. And then when I learned them, we were chadish them in the house. Right? We, and then my father said, oh, you know what? Of course. Of course we did that. I just, whatever, forgot. Um, and, and then in general with the Jewish people, let's say hair covering for a woman. My mother's, when my mother, when my parents got married, so, so you know, some did, some didn't. It, was, it wasn't one of those strong halachas now. It's incredible that it came back in a strong way. It's such a davening for women. Also, when my mother was 
when they were younger, they didn't, they didn't have, they didn't do what we do. And so it's coming stronger even now, all the halacha. And that's a very, very good thing. Okay, so now I want to I want to share with you um, one of the very powerful and important uh, and cute um, gematrias ben Chanukah, and that is like this: We all know that Beis Shammai Beis Hillel. I don't know if you do know this, but if you why is Chanukah written in the Gemara Shabbos? Because it's talking about how do you light your Shabbos candles? Do you use wax? Do you use candles? Do you use oil? Do you use kerosene? So in the Gemara, it talks about how you light Shabbos candles, and then it segues into, and what about Hanukkah candles? What's, what oils are used for Hanukkah candles? That's why it's in Shabbos, one of the reasons. So in the Gemara Shabbos, there's a machlokas, there's a, a, a very famous, a very, very famous discussion of how do you light Shabbos candles? We know the first night you light one, the second night you light two, the third night you light, night you light three, etc. And we always light the newest one first, but did you know that really in the Iker Hadin, you just need to light one candle a night, just one, just to show tonight, tonight's a miracle, a miraculous. If you're, if Chas a person is poor, or in the times of the Holocaust, when they, you know, they were just saving their margarine for like a, a they would put a, a piece of uh, like string from their clothing into a piece of margarine and somehow find out how they found fire to light it and would light for it would like, you know, sparkle for a few seconds and then fizzle out. That's all. That's what you're, you're fulfilling the mitzvah Hanukkah lift, even by one. But we're rich, so we all light first light one, second light two, etc. So you all know there's a very big question about why we light eight, why we have eight days of Hanukkah when the miracle of the oil was only seven days. Just to remind you, because it's been a year since Hanukkah, we know that there were Greeks and there was a war for, wars for, I think, 68 years, there were wars. And finally, these incredible Jews kicked out the Greeks, and the Greeks were so frustrated. They said, like, let's get out of here already. These people are so annoying. And they left Israel, and we were able to maintain our own independence for over 300 years. And the miracle was they came into the base of Mikdash, which it was the second base of Mikdash, and they wanted to light the menorah, symbolizing purity, and they couldn't find any oil that was kosher because all the, the Greeks had opened up the bottles of oil and contaminated them, used them for their idolatry, whatever. And they finally found this cute little pot shema and they found some kind of a, a, a vial of oil and it had the stamp of the coin Godel. And some say the stamp was the letter chet, the letter ches, right? That was the stamp of the coin Godel. And they, it was sealed and they used that and it was, and they found it and it, and it, and it was only enough oil for one night. And it, for one day, and it lasted eight days. Therefore, we celebrate eight days. So the, the the strong question is, why do you celebrate eight days? The miracle of the light was only seven days. It's a very very famous question. There's hundreds of answers to this. And uh, one answer is the simplest answer. The most simple answer of shot is, listen, the fact that they found uh, the found the fact that they found oil to begin with is a miracle. So we're going to celebrate one day that miracle. Or the more shot answer is the fact that they were able to kick out all the Greeks. And this miracle, this uh, military victory, that was a miracle. So the first day we're celebrating the military victory. The second, then the rest, we celebrate the oil victory. But if that's the case, if the first day is celebrating a military victory, so why light oil? Why not like, I don't know, make duels or, I don't know, do something military or just say hello. Why light oil if it's not, if that wasn't the, uh, if it wasn't about the oil. So 101 answers, different for him. But one answer, the very simple, a very simple mathematical answer is like this. Listen to this. The Gemara says, based Shammai, based Hillel says, every day you light one, the second day is two, or day three, and you go. You get, you go, you do more. Every day, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Based Shammai said, no, no, no. First day, show the entire array of all eight um, candles, <laughs> all eight, and then every day decrease one. And Beishama had a reason for that. We'll see in a second one. So the, so the Gemara Pascha, so we Pascha like, we rule like Beis Hillel. And so, um, you know, this week was the Yerza of the Bas Ayans, and we like to say, we love to learn his works. By the way, um, Zahaba, you know that the Bas Ayan, his Rebbe was the Mori Naim, and maybe that's why you got things about the Bar Mitzvah, about the birthday, right? You knew that, yeah. So anyway, um, 
That's why his name is Ban Ayin. His Rebbe's called, his Rebbe wrote a sefer called Ma'or Ayin, which means the light of the eyes. We learned it once, to, uh, maybe not in this class. It's good to have that sefer and to look inside it. It, cle it clears out your eyes, it washes your brain. It's a very holy sefer, Ma'or Ayin. To learn it, to read it. And his students, he called himself the Bat Ayin, like the, you know, the pupil of the eye, like the child of the eye, like an honor for his, of his Rebbe. So the Bas Ayin says something amazing. He says, if you cheshben out like this, we want Beis Hillel to win. Why do we want Beis Hillel to win this argument? It's very important for Beis Hillel to, to win this argument, for Hillel to win the argument. Why? Because the Abu Jaham says, the letters of Hanukkah, Chet, Nun, Vav, Chaf, He, spell Chet, Neirot, Vehalacha, Kebeis Hillel. Right out of Hanukkah, Chet, Nun, Vav, Chaf, He, the first chet is a it means ches, eight. The nun means neros, lights, candles. The vav means vehalacha, and the law is the chaf is kibes, like the teach like the yeshiva of, and the he is hillel. So Hanukkah represents ches neros, the halacha kibes hillel, Hanukkah itself. The name itself is testifying that hillel has to win this argument. Why is it so important for Hillel to win this argument? We'll see in a second, because we don't have any other arguments in Shas that, I mean, I'm not an expert in Shas, but we don't have any other holidays that talk of that make it so important, like that stress, Hillel. And not just that, but the reason we make it eight days, according to the Vasai, he says like this, if it was a seven-day holiday, then look what's going to, you know this? Then on the first day for base. Uh, Hillel, on the first day you have one candle, second day two, third day three, fourth day, fourth day four, fifth day five, right? If it's a seven day holiday, then the seventh day, according to Beis Shammai, you have all the candles. You have eight, you have seven candles, seven, six, five, four, yeah, you have seven candles. The sixth day you have six candles, the fifth day five candles, and the fourth day also four candles. So on the four, if it was a seven day holiday, and not an eight day, but if it was a seven day holiday, then on the fourth day, nobody would know who won that machlokas because the fourth day would have four candles, both according to Beis Shammai and according to Beis Hillel. Now you might say, well, that's good. We would like that to be like, finally they're making peace, right? But no, the Basayin says it has to be an eight day holiday so that to make sure that there's not one day that your base Hillel's calculation and base Shammai's calculation is the same. It means it's so important for base Shammai's calculation to win this machlokas, to win the day. So why is that? So after the couple, we make a holiday that's eight days, we add an extra day to make sure to clarify that base Shammai loses this argument and base Hillel wins this argument. Why is that? Why is it so important? And so the answer is, one of, the, one of the infinite answers, because Torah has infinite answers to everything. One of the answers is, because Shammai comes from the place of Givura. Hillel comes from the place of Chesed. The root of the soul of Hillel, and therefore the root of all the Psak Halacha, and all of the Halachas of Hillel, is coming from the, 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 tzad, the side of, of Chesed. Chesed means loving kindness, uh, Un unconditional love, as we know. Avram Avinu, that's, that's Hillel. And we know that, uh, and then uh, Shammai comes from Gevura, Din, Yitzchak Avinu, judgment, justice. Uh, 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 if we could say like this, like a stricter, a stricter outlook. Hillel is more lenient. And, and all the halachas, except I think for eight, the machlokas in the Gemara, Hillel wins everything. Because except for the time says Shammai is actually more lenient, but Hillel is a little bit more lenient if we could say such a thing. And Shammai is a little bit more strict if we could say such a thing. So Hanukkah, listen to this. Hanukkah is a holiday that has to lead us into Mashiach. Hanukkah and Purim. But right now we're dealing with Hanukkah, it has to lead us into Mashiach. And at the very, very end of time, before Mashiach comes, we have to be lenient. We can't be so strict with ourselves, with our kids, with our our friends, with our, we have to be able 
to judge favorably and not to be so harsh. We know that after Mashiach comes, Chazal tell us that when Mashiach comes, we will keep halacha like Beis Shammai. We will do the more strict. Why? Because our soul will be stronger and our capacity to live life will be, will be stronger. We will be fortified with the power of, the, of, the, of Mashiach Tzikenu and of his, our Yechida, our soul will be, uh, will be fortified. And so we'll have, then we'll say, Hashem, I want to be made, I want to make sure that everything I do is not 99.999% perfect, but 100% perfect, 1,000% perfect. And we won't, be, uh, we won't be unduly strict, means we won't make up new things, but we will take the halacha and do it in the best possible way. That's what Shammai represents. He represents the ability to keep the Torah when we have a strength of soul. Right now, until Mashiach comes, our souls are incredibly weak, and they get weaker and weaker in every generation, to the point where, again, like, uh, you know, May a whole uh, 100 years ago, they, they didn't play with balls, and baseballs, and footballs, and soccer balls, and basketball balls, it was like treif. And now, in the best yeshivas, you know, they're saying, like, of course, you, it's a mitzvah now to play with a ball, right? In olden days, right, uh, with everything, with everything, you know, in the Nevardikers in olden days, they would, they, the men from the yeshiva of Nevardik, they would walk around like schleppers. They would walk around in torn clothing and ugly clothing because they wanted to work on the mida of humility. Now, oh no, no, yeshiva boy has to be dressed respectfully and beautifully. And, you know, he has to have the nicest, shine his shoes, you know, because he has to feel good about himself and he has to look like a dignified person. So at the end of time, we don't have strength anymore to, uh, you know, no one's going to tell you to kasher your own chickens. I remember when, when they, I remember cashing chickens when I was a kid. Nowadays, the Vat HaRabbanim, years and years ago, of all the, you know, all the major Orthodox organizations decided, no, every kosher butcher now has to cashier the chickens because the people are not going to do it. In the olden days, of course they would do it. Like, how? who would think not to cash the chickens? But now, so we're weaker. We go by base. Hillel Chanukah is the holiday of Look at the person's light. Look at the person's shiny face. Don't look at anything else. Look at the Hillel in them. Look, don't look at the Shammai. Look with Hillel eyes. The, the name itself is stressing. Be like Hillel. Judge favorably. Be loving. Be good. See their candle. Don't be judgmental, Hanukkah. The whole Hanukkah. And we know that that's a hard, a hard thing to do. That's why we have eight days. Eight days is above nature. The Maral teaches eight is above nature. We have to go above our natures to just see the see the neshama in every person. Don't see the outward. Just look at the neshama. That's Hanukkah. And that's why it's so important that Hillel wins this battle for Hanukkah. And that's why Hillel, you say, you say Hillel's name every single day in davening because it says in the in, in Sukkotism, in the Parak right after Ashri, Harofe, Harofe Lishwele, God is the one who heals broken hearts. Harofe starts with a hey. Lisha Vurev starts with Lamed, Lev, Lamed, that's Hillel. I didn't make this up, Chazal tell us this. That Hashem is telling us at the end of time, we're all brokenhearted, we're all weak, our hearts are weak. Not about heart attacks, Chaz Hashem, just our emotions are so fragile. And our, and our devotion to Hashem is so, is so fragile, the littlest thing knocks us off. That's Hillel, that's when we have to access Hillel energy. And that's why Hanukkah is such a beloved holiday because it's like Hashem saying, I'm going to take care of you. And I know that it's hard. And I know that it's a little tiny light. It's not like it's big giant Xmas tree with huge lights and 10, 20 feet high. It's a tiny light. You have a tiny spark in you. It's okay. I love that. And I want that. I'm going to focus on that. That's our feeling. When you light the, when you look at the Hanukkah, when we look at the Hanukkah candles, we have to think about every single person in our life. Start with your husband and your, or if your parents are still alive and your siblings and your kids, whatever order, every single one, I want to judge them favorably. I want to see their fire. I want to see their beautiful, holy fire. And I don't want to pay attention to the stupid short skirt. Eh, forget it. I want to see the neshama. And I want to love them like Hillel loved everybody.
because he said that's the only way to make karav. When Shammai, when Mashiach comes, we're going to have an extra certain, a certain level of strength, and we'll be able to live stronger. There are a lot of Rabbanim and Sadiqim and Sikaniyos who live like Shammai right now, and they don't, they don't do it to suffer. They just want to do everything they can to come close to Hashem, another mitzvah, another chesed, another, another. But for all of us regular people, Hillel is the way to go. And so I want to share with you, Hashem gave um, a, a gift to the world that we want to always remember. All the tzaddikim, we know that again, as we said, Hanukkah is a rabbinical holiday. And um, and uh, and it's a limas chus. It's a very good thing for the Jewish people that everyone keeps it. And so we want to pray for the rabbanim. In Hanukkah, it's that you know it's a thing. Hanukkah chinuch chinuch means education. It was always a thing, you know, to give Hanukkah presents to the teachers and of your kids' schools, right? And because Hanukkah chinuch mechanachim, right? So it's a very important thing now to pray for all the Rabbanim. We have to pray for our tzaddikim. They need a lot of protection. They need protection from their being attacked. Chas I hope not. But we have to daven for them, especially women should daven for them. Women should daven that all the tzaddikim and sikhaniyos, all the righteous people, should be surrounded with a wall of protection that no negativity, no outside forces should have any power at all. All the kids, all the Rosh Hashivas, all the Yeshivas, all the Jewish people, we have to daven for everybody. The whole Hanukkah, just keep davening. Don't stop, non-stop davening for everybody you could think of. That's, by the way, the ultimate Hanukkah gift you want to give to somebody. Remember in olden days, you used to get a gift that would say like, uh, you know, a $25 uh, tree was planted in your name, you know, in Israel someplace, right? We... Now in Shemitah, we, you know, we, we don't give those gifts. We give different gifts. You know, money was given in, to Shemitah farmers in your name. Um, but the best gift you can give to somebody is a spiritual gift. And that is daven for them. And by the way, you don't need to know their Hebrew name. You could, you could say their English name. They could be, you could think about them. Just think about their visage. Think about their face in your mind. If you want to do like a lot of people. Okay, I want to share with you um, something from, from the Holy Rabbi, the Holy Rabbi, the Yenuka, Rabbi Shlomo uh, Yehuda. He gave a shir two years, I don't know if it's two years ago or three years ago. I'm ready. You know, the whole Corona thing knocked us off in terms of time. So when did Corona start? Before two years ago or before three years ago? I think two years ago, right? Just two? Yeah, two. So the Hanukkah before Corona started, um, Rabbi Shlomo Yehuda gave a shir to thousands and thousands of yeshiva people. And I wasn't there because I didn't, I only heard about him from the shir. And women were there in the gallery. They have a, they're, oh, they make him old mechubat for women. Women come and, um, and he gave a shir on, on the third day of Hanukkah, third or the fourth day, because they had the menorah lit. And, um, and in the shir, interestingly enough, only afterwards did people cop this. In the shir, he said a very strange statement. He said, I don't know when the next time we'll be able to make a shir like this is. And then, you know, Corona closed the whole world up. Um, and only looking back, when people looked at that shir months later, they said, oh, well, what did he think about? But whatever, I'm not, I, I don't want to talk about, you know, miracle things, miracle stories. But he said a beautiful teaching. It says in Mishle, so I wanted to share a beautiful teaching. So much of his teaching is, is so hard to understand. He, he goes like, he's like a tzadok. He goes from thought to thought to thought to thought. Like he goes through the whole shas and the whole Torah in one shir. And, you know, you can like, like a little bit like, uh, anyway. So but this part, this little nugget, I was able to understand. So I want to share it with you. It says in Mishle, it says in Mishle, 24 and 15. It says, Maori Naim, we're just talking about the Maori Naim because that's it, that we're learning from the Bas Ay, the Maori Naim was his Rebbe. The Maori Naim is Samach <coughs> Um When a person's happy, their eyes sparkle. That's one way to translate it. Some say the opposite. Some say if you make your eyes happy, then, then you'll be happy. Like if you smile till you crinkle your eyes, 
then you'll, it'll help you to be happy. It goes both ways. And good news fattens your bones. Fattens your bones. Okay, so what does that mean? So he explains like this. He says that something very interesting. Um, this is going to sound a little bit, it's going it's, to, this might be hard for people to hear, certain people. And I'm, I'm asking forgiveness for all the holy people who are listening to this who might not, who might not, it's hard for them to hear this. But the body of a Jewish person is not exactly the same as the body of a non-Jew. And even though, yes, you can have an uh, organ transplant, right? But there's a fundamental difference between the body of a Jew and the body of a non-Jew. We don't necessarily physically, we can't necessarily physically measure that difference, except in this one area. The Rebbe Reb 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 says, Reb the Yenuka says, that our the Yenuka, his name is Reb Shlomo Yehuda Be'eri. We call him the Yenuka. He's a young genius and he's a special, special, unusual remarkable person. Uh, he says like this, what does it mean, that good news fattens your bones? He says the bones of a Jew are filled not with marrow, of course with marrow, but what makes the bones of a Jew, the miracles that Hashem does to each different Jew goes into the bones of, of that particular Jew. And meditating on the miracles that we have, thinking about the miracles that you've gone through in life. The miracle of we just woke up in the morning. Every single thing, everything is really a miracle. Everything is a miracle. So meditating on the miracles of your, and then your personal, unique miracles that happen to you, it's not going to make you fat. Don't think it's going to make you fat. It's not a fat thing. It's a strengthening of your bones. It's a strengthening of your structure. It's a strengthening of your earth element because the earth element is the structure of the body. Just thinking about the miracles, Shmua Tova, the good news that you had, the miracles that happen to you in your life, that's what he says, is the stuffing of our bones. And Hanukkah is, so he says about Hanukkah, that Hanukkah was a national miracle. And therefore, every Hanukkah, our, our structure as a nation gets thicker, gets stronger, gets fatter, gives you good news, all good news. And he calls good news a miracle. So in this week's parsha, Yaakov Avinu bows down to Esau seven times. This is a teaching from a mild Biderman. He bows down to Esau seven times. And we know that Chazal criticized him. Ooh. So there's a back and forth, just like with Noah. Was Noah a real tzaddik or was he a relative tzaddik? Uh, Yaakov Vino, our, our grandfather Yaakov, uh, was criticized by why are you bowing down to him seven times. So there's a on both sides, there's a hill and a shamay. Of course, not that particular, but not those particular two, but there's two sides to that argument. On one hand, he was humbling himself before him, trying to make peace. On the other hand, the, the Ramayal says like this, he says, that Yaakov Avinu, everything that he did, every kavana that he had, was not for himself. Hashem gave Yaakov Avinu a private, a private promise that he will survive, that his kids will survive, and that they will create a big nation. So he wasn't afraid for himself that he's going to be hurt personally. Everything that he, in his confrontation with Esau was about us, his future generations, and will we survive? And will we be able to over, overpower uh, and, and, and just survive the exile. And so the Pasuk in Mishle, sorry, I told you the wrong Pasuk before. The Pasuk I just told you about from the Rav was Mishle Tetvav Laman. Shmua Tova Tadash and Etzen was Mishle 15, chapter 15, verse 30, Tetvav Laman. Now, the other Mishle Pasuk is Chafdal uh, Tetvav. That's where it says, Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vikam. A tzaddik could fall and fail seven times, but he picks himself up. She picks herself up. So why did Yaakov Inu bow seven times? And later on, Shlomo Hamelk, his grandson, wrote this pasuk to tell us in the 21st century, in the Goyish year 2021, in our year Tavshin Pei Beis, 
you might fail in front of Asav and bow down to him. Even at multiple times, bowing down to Asav. Asav is now a parallel to the Yetzirah. You might have failed. You might fail every 10 seconds. You might, a person might fail. Why the number seven? Seven means on the totality of what we do in this world. You might have failed seven times. Get up. Pick yourself up. Don't stay bowed. Yaakov, I bowed to you. You know why? So then I could pick myself up. I bowed again because I'm going to pick myself up. Because you can't bow seven times and stay bowed. Like to bow seven times, when you bow down, you got up. Bow down, you got up. And my final bowing down, I got up. That's what Hanukkah is. And that's what the miracles that the tzaddikim are. And we are praying for is that we should have the strength to get up and to say, I, it's, us, it's true, I failed. Okay, I failed, but I'm going to get up again. That's what a Jew is. A Jew is fighting till the very, very end. In the end of the end, we know that we're going to win. Every battle is sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Every little battle, but the whole war, we win. So just keep picking yourself up. Keep picking other people up. Looking at the good. Looking at the good. You can only be in this generation. You can only help someone and be the car of them by looking at the good. Criticizing is not the way to go. It's not going to work. By looking at the good and by modeling beautiful behavior. You're the best. You're a beautiful Jew. That's how you make car of somebody. Not by telling them, by the way, you should do this and do that. No. You just be a beautiful Jew. That's the way you're going to be the car of somebody. And, that's, that, and then you'll see your, their light and they'll see your light. And Hanukkah is all about seeing everybody's menorahs, going outside after you've lit your menorah, or looking out the window. And seeing everybody else's menorah. I have it for years and years in the apartment that I'm living in now. How do I know what time to light candles? I look across the street. I see when they, because there's a certain rub that lives across the street. I see when they light, I know to light. So look at everybody else's light. Look at your light. Okay, now I had to answer a question, right, Jillian? Yeah, okay, yeah, so what? I was just going to open, I just opened my microphone to say, please just the question, yeah. Is the person who's on asked the question? Is she um, on? No, her daughter. I think I saw her daughter. Okay. I okay. can't see. I think the question no. was the significance of the names of our biblical ancestors yeah. when their Jewish parents, their non-Jewish parents, were the ones who named them, right? Abraham was named by Terah, his non-Jewish, non-righteous father, whatever. And then Ritha was named by... Um, by the Suel, right? And then Rachel was named, Rachel and Bill and Zilpa were named by Lava. So bad people named some of our mothers and one of our fathers. So what does that mean about the significance of their names and why do we take them? And and, and how does that work with Hashem putting Ruch HaKodesh into the into the um, into the minds of their of Lava and the Suel, right? Yes, that's how Hashem makes it. Hashem makes it like that. That Hashem makes that whatever name he wants in the Shema to have, he puts it in the, into the mind of the parents, even if it sounds so way out, so out there, and so inappropriate, or so surprising. Hashem gets the Neshama's name out there. And even if evil people name a person, um, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the description of their soul. Now, Rivka, as we know, Abraham, Hashem changed his name, right? So he changed his name. And all the other women, Rivka, Rachaleya, Bilna Zilpa, and Sarah, of course. Avram, uh, Hashem changed Avram Avinu Sarah's name. But everybody else, they got, they retained their name from their unrighteous father. But Hashem, look what Hashem did. Hashem foiled the plans because Leia means weak. And Rachel also means weak. It means a sheep. It means a follower. And, um, and Bilha means worn out. And Zilpa means Lizalzel. It means... Uh, uh, to put to to make fun of, and Rivka is also like it means like a bakar, like a animal. So Lavan and Suel had such bad intentions when he. Made, but guess what? Hashem turned them all over, and Leah re, 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 rearranged the letters. You get Ohel, and Rachel becomes becomes the the animal of um, of the of the of the new of the mazel of of uh, Nisa, the lamb. And Bilha and Zilpa become, um, their names become, the Beis Laman of Bilha is the first side of the Torah, last side of the Torah. And Zilpa is, in Aramaic, it means to go quickly. So he had bad, he had a bad idea, and Hashem changed it into a good idea. 
So yes, that's what we use those names. And guess what? Even if, if a person gets a name um, that was given to them by uh, non-religious parents. Yeah, you collected sand from the party. And, um, and that non-Jewish is even not, I'm sorry, and not religious parents. And the not religious parent gives the person a Jewish name the proper way, like a boy is given a bris mila and the, the not religious father says the name Binyamin, let's say, or whatever. That's Hashem puts it into the makes the merit of that particular parent. That's one of their merits. So, yeah, they get the they get the Ruch HaKodesh. So the Neshama gets its instruction and it gets his energy and it's and it gets taken care of. So even those people look look at Batya, right? Okay, Batya was a Sadekis, but Batya was the one who married, who named Moshe Rabbein. And at the time that she made names, when she wasn't yet, uh, you know, she was righteous, she was searching, but she was still an Egyptian princess. Look at Yishmael. Even Yishmael's name that was given to him, Hashem gave him that name, but, um, and his mother Hagar was told the name by the angel. But we, in the Gemara, we don't use the name Yishmael by Jews anymore, but in the Gemara there was Rabbi Yishmael. There was Rabbi Yishmael Kohen Gadol. Anyway, thank you, by the way, for allowing us to, uh, to doing the names, uh, the names classes because it became very popular. So uh, a lot of people benefited from it very much. What did you say? Somebody on the phone? What? I didn't see them. One second. Let me see what you wrote. I have to do this. No. Oh, no. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Do you want me to read it? You want me here? Oh, you muted now. Can I just not hear? Sorry, the littlest, you this is such a, like, it's so sensitive, this uh, thing. You touched the wrong thing. And uh, one sec. Can you see it or do you want me to read it to you? Uh, I'm just looking at it now. One sec. Okay. Uh, her name is no. Uh, okay, um, you have to get all these questions. I, I would prefer that you ask a rabbi. Is that um, um, you have to ask a rabbi who who really knows what they're talking about with names. Um, because the abbreviate, if they told you to do it in that order, Mendel Sheva, that means that the abbreviations, Mem Shin is important. Mem Shin could be the Mashmesh, which means to make something happen. And Shin Mem, Shem, Shem. That shouldn't be a problem. Um, I don't know, you have to ask a rabbi about changing the name of the lady without kids. 12 years without kids. I only, I can only tell you that, um, that I have experience with people who change their name or added a name or added, change the spelling on a name, which means you have to change the ketuba. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's changed and it helps them a lot with kids. So, and the order of a name does count. Okay.